Thanks, that was very nice. So we're gonna firstly, first go through introductions, but I wanna kind of preface this with a couple of things. We had a phone call a couple of weeks ago, and I'm actually gonna try to recreate that phone call for everybody here, because it was so dynamic and so interesting that we all learned something from each other, and it was very fluid. So instead of having us just kind of talk for 10 minutes, talk for 10 minutes, talk for 10 minutes, we're gonna interrupt each other, we're gonna pound our fists on the table, we're gonna give our opinions and talk about what we know and what we're seeing in the industry. Um, so first, I'll start with Tim on the far left over there, if you can grab your microphone and give us your 15 second elevator speech and introduction about yourself, anything you want to say. Hello. What? And that was Tim, everybody. Give him a round of applause for that. Thank you. Um. <laughs> Well, now I get my 15 seconds. I'm Tim Blake. I'm the founder and the creator of the Emerald Cup. It's our 15th year. It's the largest organic outdoor cannabis competition in the world. Uh, I also have uh, vertically integrated uh, farms, four farms. I have a nursery, uh, genetics, uh, manufacturing site, distribution, and product company. So I'm, I'm pretty well uh, attached to every part of the industry. Hi, my uh, name is Sabrina Fendrick. I'm director of government affairs for Berkeley Patients Group, and I've been involved in the cannabis space for about 10 years. Before BPG, I worked as an activist for National Normal for about seven years. Thanks, Sabrina. I'm Amanda Ostrowitz. I'm the CEO of Canaregs. We're a technology platform that tracks all the laws and regulations in the cannabis space, everything from when a uh, city council first talks about the subject through their ordinances and so forth, and it's great to see so many of our subscribers in the audience today. Fiona Ma from San Francisco, home of the medicinal cannabis um, movement. Um, served on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, uh, then six years in the state assembly. Now I am your friendly tax collector, uh, <laughs> trying to collect sales taxes on the dispensaries and found the big elephant in the room is lack of banking access. So I am and have been working on banking access for this industry. And uh, let's uh, also mention that she's the next California yeah. state treasurer. Fiona's running for state treasurer. Um, since this is a private event, I can endorse her. So please go out and vote November 6th, is it? Yeah. November, November 6th. 6th. Fiona has been a supporter of this industry since it was born. And she's uh, teamed up with a lot of folks up in San Francisco and Sacramento that will make this industry easier and better for us. I have witnessed Fiona personally on a number of uh, panels that John Chung, the current state treasurer, has put together to try to solve and crack the nut of banking. I personally represent a lot of financial institutions in my, in my legal practice, some in cannabis-related stuff and some in non-cannabis-related stuff. And even the national banks want into this industry. But there are so many different limitations that are, are put on them as a national institution, especially when their federal charter is based you know, from a grant from the federal government. They are not going to put that at risk if they're a multi-trillion dollar bank. But if you're familiar with the ba way banks operate, they have these stress tests. And the stress tests measure how much cash they have on hand, how much assets they have on hand, and how much debt they have outstanding. And a lot of these banks are imbalanced in these stress tests. And when they're imbalanced, that means they need cash. And this is an industry that is full of cash and nowhere to bank it. So I'm working with a number of state chartered banks right now to actually create protocols for them to take limited deposits from highly vetted depositors. What does that mean? That means that not everyone is gonna get access to a bank. And the people that I see right now in the industry getting access to banking are those that are coupled with something else, like the private equity group that's investing in a cannabis group, and they private equity guys have the banking relationship and get the cannabis group that they invested in to, to partner up with the bank that they're working with. So there's a lot of a lot of politicking going on behind the scenes. Sorry, I didn't mean to make that well, word I'm a bad add word. I'm going to add in later on. Okay. Yeah. So the first issue I wanted to talk about was actually ask Fiona, what is she seeing right now in the banking landscape from your perspective as a tax collector, and then what you see going forward when you sit in the treasurer's seat. So uh, Senator Bob Hertzberg and I had a bill, SB 930, that uh, would have allowed state chartered financial institutions to apply for a limited uh, um, permission to bank the cannabis industry. Um, we were hoping that this would have to be a closed loop system, privately insured, but uh, we were hoping that a number of institutions would be uh, part of the network and folks could deposit their uh, cash and they could pay their vendors through like a Venmo or PayPal type of system. Uh, they could pay their taxes and they could pay their rent, which is like the largest um, 
you know, one of the largest expenses. However, the bill got stuck in the Assembly Appropriations Committee. Uh, Bob Hertzberg and I are going to run the bill again, but uh, I have something to announce. Oh, uh, excellent. Senator Steve Bradford, who is chair of the Banking Committee, and I are going to run a public bank bill next year. Um, many of you have advocated advocated for it and uh, running um, the bill uh, this past year, seeing how much support we got from legislators on both sides of the aisle, hardly any no votes. I think it is time. People in Sacramento understand that this is a crisis and we need to get something done. So I look forward uh, to working with the next governor uh, on, on more of these type of uh, issues. Excellent. All right. So when we had our phone conversation, one of the biggest issues that came up um, was taxes, along with educating consumers and educating people in the public. So I want to now turn it over to Tim, who had a very interesting perspective on taxes and issues dealing with the farms up north and what's happening to them because of the, the tax crunch, for lack of a better word. So if you could kind of explain what's going on and, and how you're seeing that world right now, because it was to me it was fascinating, because being in Southern California and dealing with a lot of indoor growers and, and distributors and banks, I'm not seeing the, the landscape that you're seeing in the trenches. Well. Um it's, it's a, even larger than a tax issue. It's a, it's a, it's a calamity. Uh, you look, uh, four years ago, we brought up about 400 people to uh, Eureka to have a gathering of uh, the supervisors and the fire department, everybody to talk about how we were going to embrace cannabis. And there was a standing ovation at the end. It was an incredible experience. Last week, the BCC came up to Humboldt to you know, do their road show, and there were less than 35 people in the audience. There was nobody that showed up. No one. There were more people from the state than there were there. And I explained to them that's because they've given up. There's no hope. There's like, uh, Justin talked about a grieving going on. Swami talks about a thousand cuts. Uh, you basically have people that, it's a perfect storm where it wasn't just the taxes, it is the taxes, but it, it's uh, the land use. You've got the cultivators that have to now apply to building codes. Uh, you, you've got them having to deal with water boards. Up, up north, you could get away with doing whatever you wanted for a long time, <clears throat> excuse me, because the water boards and fish and game weren't in. Uh, now that they're in, it's like they used to fly helicopters and then you had to go get a, a warrant, prove that you could go in there and they go to a lot of trouble with cops. Now you just fly over with Google Map, you see it on a computer, you send the ten dollars to $20,000 a day fine, tell them they got to shut down and they have to. So they're sending out hundreds of notices throughout Humboldt it's shut, and, and Trinity and, and Mendocino. They're shutting down the markets. Uh, the people that have been here for 40, 50, 60 years doing this, if you looked at the size of Mendocino and Humboldt Trinity, and Emerald Triangle, it's larger than most of the small states in this country. If this was, like they said, if this was a coal issue with coal farmers, or if this was a farming issue in Kansas, there's more farmers being wiped out in the Emerald Triangle than there are in Kansas or any place where they're subsidizing farm, farm labor and farm. Are, are those farmers having trouble even getting through the licensing process? Are they getting licensed well, locally you, at the state? Well, what, if you're talking about that, you've got uh, less than 300 uh, licensed farms in Mendocino, less, you know, less than 400 in Humboldt. Uh, they're, they're having a very challenging time because of, you know, Ed Rosenthal said it, we argued years ago, and it's true. Humboldt, Mendocino, they weren't made for traditional farming. The land's steep, there's no soil, lack of water, you know, it's challenging. But then you've got deserts out here that are bringing 500,000 square foot farms in, and they're taking the water from the Sierras or wherever else they're taking it from, and they're not in trouble, but the landowners up in Mendocino can't use their own water. So between the building codes, the taxes, everything, you're basically gonna look at 75% of the people that built this industry are gonna be gone. And in, in addition to that, you got the micro businesses and they're not letting people do home micro businesses for the most part. So the product makers, the small people that did all that are gone too. So I'm excited about 64, I voted for it. I'm with Fiona and everything else. I know we're gonna be in a great world. The consumers are gonna get the best products they could ever hope for. We're gonna have you know, cost-effective medicine. People are going to jail. I'm a huge advocate for all the people rotting away in jails across this country. And so I don't want to say it's negative. It's a great thing we're going into. But he asked about what we're seeing for the small farmers and small product makers, and it is a, an extinction event that they're going through right now. Um, I'm going to dovetail with that, that issue to, to Sabrina and to Amanda, both on the education issue, because I think that ties into having knowledge about the industry, how, how to deal with everything from supply chains to consumers and everything else. Um, First with Amanda, from, from your perspective, what are you seeing as the biggest challenges for your customers, your clients, and everything else getting access to information? Well, it's not just about access to information. They might have the access, but it's, I mean, you can't take the tax issue lightly. Like, we, we just talked about it in Humble and Mendocino and Trinity, but this is a statewide problem. 
So, I mean, we got to look at first the fact that California is entirely different than any other state, right? They passed medical laws in 1996, and local government until very recently was the only ones regulating this. So at the time, they could put in tax rates that were higher because there was no state taxes, but even those are still prohibitively high uh, when you layer state and local. But really what happened is a couple you know, consulting firms uh, went around the state and you know, told all these cities, if you allow and regulate cannabis, we're going to make you all this revenue. And they kind of made some promises of rates that were too high, rates that are prohibitively high. And we're seeing some cities starting to lower them, but a lot of people are just moving out, giving up, or staying in the black market. And um, the problem is, is once they've heard these lofty numbers, it's really hard for them to come back down. So part of this is the education to these cities of understanding that these things are also going to bring in other revenues in different ways. You know, we went down to Lemon Grove one day, uh, myself and a few of our clients to go to a city council meeting. And we went to the bar afterwards and had a couple drinks. And it was interesting because we weren't the regulars that were drinking $2 PBRs. We were having $7, $8 drinks. And it took the people in, these, in this bar were like, wait. So the cannabis business isn't just going to grow. They're, they're going to come to our bar and spend money. Oh, wait, that means they're also going to go to the grocery stores, right? You're going to buy houses. And this group of random people in the bar understood the economic impact that cannabis might have on their town. But that's not as simple or common an experience of what's being you know, put out there. And these cities are really needing to take a look at what is the overall job creation and economic impact that regular sales tax could do there and these companies as a whole, and then talk about what are reasonable tax rates. Um, and that's really where we're seeing a lot of issues with this, uh, because a lot of people are just playing copy and paste the neighbor. Well, if they can do $25 a square foot, why if, wouldn't if we do If only we had it, somebody that foot? collected taxes that could give us their perspective on that issue, right? We do track every <laughs> single tax rate in the state. <laughs> and we've seen some, like, we, we tell people though, all right, yes, we have this chart that has every single tax rate, but just because you see this one a lot does not mean it's a good one. <laughs> you have to look at these tax rates and actually look at the, the patterns of cities lowering them. So, you know, one of our subscribers is the city of Kalinga. They went in and they actually lowered theirs, but they needed empirical, you know, data to understand why these weren't working. And they were actually able to find that information in our tool and lower their rates. But we're going to have to see a lot more of this for it to work. There's no way otherwise. Yeah, I mean, I can give sort of a real world example of that. In Berkeley, um, they had passed a 10% adult use tax in 2010 when Prop 19 was on the ballot and they were expecting it to pass. But Prop 19 didn't have any tax rates written into its actual initiative. So there was no 15% excise tax. There was no cultivation tax. And 10% at that time, it wouldn't be as significant without the tax rate. But when you're incorporating Prop 64 and all of the additional layering and compounding tax rates that you're dealing with, 10%, and the way it was written was through the whole supply chain. So if you wanted to um, get a manufactured product in Berkeley, get it tested in Berkeley, and sell it in Berkeley, that's 10% on every single layer. So that's a local tax of, of 30%, and if they ever legalize yeah. uh, cultivation in Berkeley, it would be another one. So that was a pretty big fight, and we realized very early on that this was not sustainable at all. And we were already dealing with the illicit market and trying to compete with that and those economic incentives. And so it did take a lot of educating of uh, the city council and the public. I mean, there were some people that came out of the woodwork that shocked me. I was, I was truly surprised. And in Berkeley, um, people were, were spouting this reefer madness and that um, high tax rates are... It was sort of a counterintuitive... Um, approach that they had where if you were to lower the taxes, then there would be lower revenue. And the city was so excited about all of the taxes that they were going to get. And so they were against it, the, the finance department. And we really had to remind them that everybody was going to the illicit market. They were not enforcing anything. And there were these high tax rates. And so there was really no way for them to generate the tax revenue that they were expecting with these high rates. And also explaining of how the language was written, they need to turn it, move the, the rate lower. So we got it cut after about uh, six weeks of lobbying the city council and working with the local community leaders. We were finally able to pass an ordinance that actually moved the rate down to 5% across the supply chain. Go ahead. And can I just add, um, 
Amanda brings up something, uh, sorry, um, Sabrina brings up something important when she said lobbying the city council. Um, it is really important for all of you who are in this industry and care about this industry to show up uh, at city council meetings, uh, at the state level. We have, you know, a number of, like, we had probably 10 different cannabis bills running through the state legislature. And if, if you know, elected members don't see you up there, then they say, oh, okay, well, you know, maybe they don't care. You know, it's not really important to us. We'll just, you know, not fight for it. So we are just imploring you all uh, to get more involved, you know, sign up for our newsletters, follow us on Twitter. You know, we're always announcing, you know, how you all can get more involved. And of course, get to know your local elected officials, your state assembly member, your senator, and anybody else that when issues come up, you know, please send an email, call in. I mean, your voice really does matter. And one other thing to add to about um, working with the city. So, like, the people of Berkeley are really lucky that BPG has a Sabrina and actually invests in it because they're all benefiting from it together. But you can't rely on other people to do this work for you. Like, I, I say it adamantly. Like, a compliance and government affairs program are not as simple as just hiring a compliance officer. You, and, and the difference between the ones that are, you know, okay and getting by and wildly successful are the ones that have a government affairs program. It is incredibly critical to have these pieces in place because Berkeley got to have that education from Sabrina. But the thing that we also have to be really careful with taxes and educating too is that they need to understand the different portions of the supply chain. There's different people that have been writing these tax measures um, and you can tell what an HDL tax measure looks like. It's got one like gross receipts price generally for retail and then another one across the board for all the others. If you look at an SCI consulting one or Muni services, you're going to see each piece actually getting explored differently. And you might see in one city, they might, you know, come out at $3 a square foot for cultivation. And in another, they might come out at $6 because you need to actually do the analysis of what these businesses look like in your city. The same consulting firm should come up with different answers in each of these different categories based on what is a business going to look like there, right? Imagine if you were doing the same price per square foot in Humboldt as you were doing in Los Angeles, right? They're unfair. Why? Because Humboldt, they're growing outside. You need a lot more space. Whereas indoors, they're going to grow a lot more in a much tighter, you know, spot. So you actually have to look at each vertical that you're going to be taxing and give them an individual analysis and, and make sure your government understands what those businesses look like in your jurisdiction rather than them saying, okay, well, we're right next to Oakland. Let's copy Oakland because we're, you know, neighbors. Every city is different and you so really got to educate I them. I was going to add, I, I tell this to my clients all the time that don't forget, this is still a real estate-centric business. You can't get a license without being tied to some real estate in some local jurisdiction. So you really have three masters. You have the local government master that you have to be compliant with, whether it's zoning, taxes, whatever. Then you have the state master that you have to be compliant with and make sure you're properly licensed and doing business with other licensed folks. And then, of course, you have the conflict of law with the federal government where the Treasury says one thing, the Department of Justice says another. And so you have all of these different narrow paths that you have to follow. And of course, it makes great work for lawyers like us to help you navigate it. But at the same time, it is a, a massive headache for everybody involved. And so getting information and getting in touch with those folks and, 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 and being present is, is really, really important. I wanted to transition because we have a lot of topics to cover um, and say that all of this with the tax issues, the real estate issues and everything are hamstrung even further because of the banking issues. And the banking issue is a nightmare. When I first met Fiona a couple of years ago, she came and spoke at my law firm. We hosted an event and I made a joke to her. I said, what if I just take all of my gross revenue, pay it in cash to the state and just get a refund check? And she said to me, she goes, well, she goes, it would work, but the state would become the biggest laundry money, laundry money, uh, la money launderer in the world. And I said, you're probably already the largest uh, money launderer in the world. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, right? Yeah. So but the state is who we you want, want you to, to pay your money taxes. Launderer. Like, if the state's the money launderer, then. Well, now you've got a treasury, come you've got a treasury check, right? Oh, okay. So, yeah. so here is like the great irony. Do it. <laughs> we want everyone who is selling a uh, tangible personal product to take out a seller's permit and pay your sales taxes. We don't ask who you are. We don't need a background check. We just want you to pay your taxes. And we take your taxes, count it, walk across the street to Bank of America and deposit it. However, you cannot 
go to Bank of America and open up a bank account or deposit any money into Bank of America. And if I overpay, how does that make sense? If I overpay, I get a refund check from the yes, state. Yes, if you right? overpay, you so get a refund. If check. I overpay everything, I'd get a refund check for everything, right? And I did check that because that was a loophole <laughs> to say if everybody put their money in, you know, yeah. can't we just hold then you it become, there? Then you become a for public future, bank. Well, and that's right? what that's uh-huh. where we're, we're going. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> Always trying to think outside the box, right? Um, so let me get my notes here. So I turned 46 in June, and all of a sudden I need these things on my face. And I can't see the audience when I have them on, and I can't see the paper when I have them off. So you'll see me going up and... Uh, thank you. That's how I am thank when you. I'm driving. Yeah, right? Um, so I wanted to go back to, uh, to the banking and, un- and talk to you, uh, Tim, about what, what the what the market is looking like for folks that, that they still have no access to banking up in, in, in farm country in Humboldt and everywhere else and is that also adding to the, to the crippling effect that you're seeing and also is it, is it resulting in a gray market or, or an unlicensed market where we now have competing markets of people that are dealing in the little licensed world and people that are dealing in the unlicensed world? Yeah, well, I mean, Community Credit up in Garberville and Humboldt is, is actually giving uh, some banking to cannabis people now, uh, and some of the smaller community credit unions are working with that. Uh, Humboldt, because they took all the, uh, the heavy fines against those growers, the, the black market's thriving in Humboldt, and because there's not that many licensed farmers, the, the legal market's thriving too. So right now, for farmers, it's a, a decent market, although 900 bucks a pound isn't really a great price compared to what it used to be, but at least it's stabilized from where it was five or six last year. Uh, we have uh, California Labor Solutions where we do our own labor solution and then pay cash payroll to try to get around that. But it's a, a real challenging thing. I've been telling people for 40 years, you look at Al Capone, he went to jail for tax evasion and money laundering, nothing else. So I've told people, you know, my whole life as an outlaw uh, that your partner is the IRS and your tax people. And I'll tell you what, they will get you in trouble before anybody else will. So give them their share and just be cool with them. So they're really trying to do their best to take that money in. I mean, Fiona and the state, everybody are, are really doing what they can. You can look at what's going on in the Canadian thing where they're shutting down the borders and not letting Canadian companies in and, and people. And that's because they see this powerful thing that's about to take over the whole world. While we're fighting over this, the Canadians and the Israelis and Colombians are looking at dividing up the world market. So and I have uh, clients that are creating investment vehicles in Canada simply to hold money in the Canada with the hopes that one day they can bring that money from Canada into the States. Oh, that's Constellation. Right? Look at, yeah, look that's at Coca-Cola. Constellation. That's what's the, CBD. Yeah. And, and, and a dozen others that, that we're working with that are doing the same thing. And yeah. they're just raising money in the public markets and then saying we'll have a small operation in Canada and once the floodgate opens, that money will be able to pour into the United States. Yeah, but see, you have to understand that small farmers, you know, typically if you look at the people that have been in this business, they're introverted, shy, mountain people. They went up there, they're not branding experts, they're not social media people, they don't go to a lot of events. I mean, you go to more and more events, the old timers, we say we see less and less of the old schoolers every time you turn around. You see more suits, right? Yeah, see more uh-huh. suits. And I'm not saying it's wrong, that's the industry where it's going and stuff. But I don't think there's really much you can turn that around for a lot of my friends and family and people in those mountains. The unfortunate thing is they're not going to see the new world kind of like Moses. But that doesn't mean it's not the right way to go. It's not, it is the great thing that we're doing. There just is a very challenging time for them. And we got to remember, they have it extra hard up there, too. Like, I know many that bury their money, and then there's forest fires that come through, and people have lost their entire life savings because they can't get their money into a bank. It's gone up in flames, literally. And, and where else is it going to go? It's too much to stick under a bed. And so and, we got to be like, really cognizant of that problem. And it's I will even... say that it's not... Um, banking is not... A, 100% impossible, as you were saying, uh, they kind of do it up there, but there's a lot of, um, you have to be very careful. There's FinCEN guidelines mm-hmm. and, you know, just the, the sheer physical moving of the cash from the dispensary oh. to the next place that it goes to the bank and, right. and scheduling the pickups. And, and it, it is legitimately disconcerting, I right. will say. That was something, I, when I was at Normal, I didn't, it was a sort of a talking point and an issue, but then actually being in it, seeing how it works and, and how the scheduling works. And it's, it is truly, it, it's very uncomfortable owners. and can be very scary. It's owners. And that's part of my practice. And so I actually create a checklist and due diligence checklist for banks on the, on the SAR, KYC, AML issues. And once the banks figure out how much work is involved, they don't want to do it anymore. And if you go to the board of directors and have spent all this time you know, paying a lawyer to set it up for you and the board of directors says, well, we don't want to do cannabis, all of a sudden it's just money out the window for these banks. Not that we feel bad for the banks putting money out the window, but um, <laughs> you have to realize how the suspicious activity report 
it, what it really is. In essence, the federal government has deputized the banks to act as their eyes and ears on the ground to look for suspicious activity. FinCEN, in its wisdom, took the Cole memo from the, federal, from the Department of Justice and said, we're going to bootstrap this into a way for banks to be able to, to file these suspicious activity reports, but create these limited marijuana SARs so that they can actually bank state compliant businesses. On January 4th, Jeff Sessions, as we all know, rescinded the Cole memo, but FinCEN, two weeks later, reaffirmed it and reaffirmed the FinCEN guidelines. So now the banks are kind of like, do we do what the Treasury says or do we do what the Department of Justice says? And they're in this conundrum of, of not even knowing where the federal government stands. And, and that's just a microcosm of our federal government right now, but go ahead, Fiona. Yeah. So um, we were talking about taxes uh, earlier and um, we are very low in terms of how much we have collected in California, taxes versus what we estimated. So the first six months in 2018, we collected about $82 million of taxes. We estimated we would collect about $185 million. Wow. And there's a couple of reasons, I think. Um, number one, uh, the state um, is just, um, it, is starting to issue permanent licenses, but they're waiting for the local government. And some of the localities have not approved cannabis, are still working it out, still fighting about it, or their taxes are too high where companies don't want to locate in that jurisdiction. In comparison, Nevada, for the first six months, collected $195 million in taxes, right? Colorado and Washington, which were the first two states um, to, to actually have adult use. Colorado collected $114 million, Washington $67 million. Yet Nevada just passed last year and they're at 195, more than California estimated. So, you know, I think taxes, regulations, fees, um, you know, it, it's, it's mind boggling here in California. that part of the problem is this, is that we gave too much power to the local governments and it's a patchwork uh, and mosaic of rules and laws that are very difficult to follow, very costly, and if the state would have, would set its own standard and then municipalities could just say yes or no, I think would be much easier in that regard. Um, but, and then you have, thank you guys. And then you have the other issue, which is, um, I, I, I can't remember which city is which, but Santa Ana and Costa Mesa have their own regulations about cannabis and, and how you can sell and where you can sell. And one of them says you have to have a security guard in uniform that's armed. And the other one says you can't have armed security guards and you can't have uniformed security guards. So you can literally cross the street and have a totally different scheme that you're operating under for a dispensary. And, and you're none the wiser as a consumer that this happens to be the Costa Mesa and this other side of the street happens to be Santa Ana. It's a really just discombobulated world that we're living in right now and the way it's set up. And, and so Richard, like Prop 64 passed by the voters. Right. So the only way we can change by the California any, voters, right? California voters. The only way we can change any of the provisions, the major provisions in that uh, initiative is to go back to the voters. And that's something that I think people don't understand is when uh, we pass an initiative at the state level by the people, we can only change it by going back on the ballot and asking the people if we can change it. If the legislature but If you have somebody like my mom, my mom says, isn't it legal now? And that's her whole knowledge of the world, right? All right. My mom might be here because I grew up in Long Beach since she was going to come by. Mom, are you here? No, okay, good. All right. So yes. I actually had my prom in this room and this... This pillar right here is where my date left me, so, yeah, yeah. Okay, Don't well, ask. my assistant, that... Amy, we're gonna tell stories. She's yeah. like, we used to come here and this ship is haunted and we used to hear people knocking on the walls. Oh, yeah. I'm like. <laughs> you have one mom in the audience. Yeah, yeah. that's oh, my good. mom. Oh, that's your mom? Oh, awesome, <laughs> awesome. So, um, yeah, I invited my parents, so they, they didn't show up, I guess, so. Um, it is what it is. It's not the first time. Um, <laughs> And you know, I'm one of those dads, like yesterday was soccer practice and I was, I was here, so I can't, I'm, it, it, it's history repeating itself. All right, I digress. One of the things I wanted to ask you specifically was this, and I had this conversation with Javier Becerra, I've had this conversation with Lori Ajax, and I wanna have this conversation with you, and we talked about it on the phone. The state's infrastructure for dealing with the cannabis regulations and enforcement, what does that look like right now, and what should it really look like? Well, um, be careful what you wish for. Right. Right. Um, well, the enforcement is, is not there yet. So we are still trying to uh, 
you know, just get licenses mm -hmm. issued. The track and trace system is ready to go, uh, according to Richard Parrott uh, of the Department of Food and Ag. Uh, but we're just waiting um, to issue those first licenses because everybody right now is operating under a temporary, temporary license. license. So track and trace is going to go first. Then once everyone gets onto that system, then I think we'll be able to uh, enforce those good actors versus those bad actors. Mm -hmm. That sounds excellent. So Becerra said to me when he got into office, this is right when he took over, over as Attorney General, he said, we have a great infrastructure in place for uh, sanctuary cities and sanctuary state issues and immigration to fight the federal government. And I said, well, what about cannabis? He says, we don't have anybody even assigned to a task force at this point to deal with it. And I was like, that's really interesting. Now, that was a year and a half ago, two years ago when he took over. So I'm sure the landscape has changed. But I saw um, your friend Kevin de Leon uh, six months ago and asked him what he was focused on. And it was all about the immigration issues and, and the sanctuary state issues as well. And cannabis was very far off of his radar as well, which hopefully change, changes when he, when he wins uh, the election in November. So. Uh, Sabrina, I was actually going to jump to you, oh. and uh, you're, this is not a softball. This is actually one of the things that you had mentioned to me that I thought was fascinating was how educating the staff and the rule changes are so confusing, and I wanted you to kind of expand on that and explain that to the audience, because we talk about, as a lawyer, you know, we deal with rules all the time, but with boots on the ground, I think that the, the landscape is much different. I'd like you to kind of explain the dichotomy that exists between us and our suits and the people that are on the ground. Sure, yeah. Um, well, January 1st was when all of these new rules started to take effect. And um, there was a lot of um, preparation for the staff and, and letting them know. Well, as you know, this industry has a lot of rumors. So there was a, the whole process for the emergency regulations that happened in 2017. People were, were talking. Some people thought they were implemented already. And, and people didn't really realize that you know, there were certain timelines for this. So we had to make sure that they knew that things were going to change. The rules as they are now are not gonna be the rules forever and, and please be patient with me and, and with this whole process because it's, it's completely out of my hands but we have to play by this game. So we had to you know, explain how the rules were working pre-July 1st and, and it also had to sort of switch over our whole business model, not our whole business model, but previously where we had our buyers would work directly with the vendors and didn't go through the distributors and that entire process. And then with the excise tax collection, um, there were a lot of steps, there were a lot of checklists that I had to create to uh, pass out to the staff to sort of let them know how this worked. And then when July 1st kicked in and you had the new testing rules, you had the new packaging and the new labeling rules, and then that sort of created, um, as anybody who's a retailer or distributor, manufacturer, cultivator knows, um, everybody had their own interpretation on what um, was compliant packaging or compliant labeling. All and right. so- Oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, so there was a lot of back and forth. I heard somebody on the, the earlier panel was saying, um, you know, they were sort of, uh, talking about how they had to go and talk to the retailers and the retailers were, were having their own interpretation. And, and so there was a lot of back and forth and our buyer would, would come and ask a lot of questions and, and what the distributors were telling them. You know, we, I discussed with our lawyer and we were just like, we, we can't, you know, what the DPH is telling you is compliant is great, but we're licensed by the Bureau, we're inspected by the Bureau. And I, I just don't see the Bureau thinking that it's okay to have you know, certain types of products with certain labels, it, that's not gonna fly with them. And if, if for, for example, um, no, nowhere in the regulations is really, do they address what the packaging and labeling rules are for clones or seeds. And so um, DPH doesn't address it. The Bureau doesn't really address it. And um, CDFA doesn't really address it. They just, everybody refers back to each other. Um, but then, so we were like, the only place that addresses it is in statute. It's in uh, the Business and Professions Code, which right. says every cannabis and cannabis product has to be in a child-resistant, resealable, blah, blah, blah package. And um, that upset a lot of people, and, and there's been a lot of debate, but ultimately we were like, this is literally the only thing that we can lean on, and, and we're going to have to go with this until it's there becomes... It's an actual statute. Right, actual right? statute until there's more clarity or some, you know, we always ask people if you have a letter from the Bureau that says this is okay, we can have a conversation, but, um, you know, and now everybody has to get ready because we're going to gear up for more changes. We just finished the comment period, the first round of comment period for permanent regulations and 
that's going to kick back into gear in October and November, and then there's going to be more changes in uh, 2019. One and practical takeaway, <laughs> don't buy more packaging than you can use in the next six months. They will continue to change it on you, yeah. and you will end up with a bunch of waste. And don't try to tell the retailers that it's compliant. <laughs> Go yeah, ahead, Because um, we know. And I just sat on a panel uh, with the Department of Food and Ag, California Department of Food and Ag, and also the Department, California Department of Public Health. And um, they would like folks to go to their website. They try to put as much information up there, an FAQ uh, page as well. And if you have any questions, they're really encouraging you to call them. Call or email them, okay? So that's, that's their message to everybody. I'm going to go into, oh, go ahead. It, yeah, just the CD uh, TFA has been absolutely amazing, and they definitely advocate that anything, you get everything in writing. Um, that is absolutely critical, because you talk to one person one day, and um, they'll tell you one thing, and then you talk to another person the next day, and they'll tell you something completely different. So as long as you can get it in writing, and you can show you're making a good faith effort. This panel's gone by way too fast. I'm going to go to the lightning round, but I am going to bring up one more topic very, very quickly that I'm seeing as a lawyer in the industry. Um, there are really two, two, two topics that have been coming up quite a bit, which I think you guys have to have um, just, just be, be cognizant of. One is, is that remember that bankruptcy is a federal process. And cannabis businesses and even cannabis adjacent businesses are being kicked out of bankruptcy courts because the trustees that are being assigned can't even take control of these businesses because their source of money is coming from sources that are not uh, legitimate in their eyes. So one of the things I've been doing is, is what I call alternatives to bankruptcy, assignments for benefit of creditors, which people are not very familiar with, receiverships where you go to state court, not like state court to put a receiver over the business. Um, we've been doing it on behalf of creditors, on behalf of partners that are having disputes. It's been uh, an ever-expanding landscape. And actually, this is how I got into this industry 10 years ago when a bank client asked me to deal with a property that they thought was a refrigerated warehousing facility out in Pomona and did a site inspection and discovered it was a giant million square foot cannabis grow facility. And uh, they had to call the loan but couldn't take possession of the property because they can't foreclose. So I actually put it in receivership, had the receiver sell the flower, sell the license, and sell the property. Back then it was medical marijuana use. It was not under Prop 64. Uh, four. Um, the other thing that I was going to tell you is this. Product liability claims are starting to come in the door where we're defending product liability claims. What's in, the, what's dis not disclosing properly what's in the package. Not, uh, not giving warnings to customers that are not used to eating an edible that's going to put them in bed for four days. Um, Prop 60, uh, 65 issues with chemicals that cause cancer. You know, you go into a restaurant and it says this facility may contain, you know, uh, products that contain cancerous materials or whatever. That's a huge, huge thing that's coming down the pike. You don't think that plaintiff's lawyers are out there right now waiting for those big businesses in cannabis to, uh, to, to take them to court? They are out there. And once the, once the big plaintiff's lawyers are out there suing you know, the big companies of the world, they, they, the, the targets start becoming more and more narrow. So you've got to be really cognizant of that and be very careful of that. That's what's happening. And so you bring so, up insurance. Of course. Um, our insurance commissioner, Dave Jones, uh, has been issuing licenses uh, two different insurance carriers for different type of licenses. So, you know, please look on their website. Uh, Camille Dixon is his expert uh, in th these uh, insurance issues. Yep. But um, insurance is, is coming to the market too. That's right. And I, I refer clients to insurance folks all the time at this point, and they, and they come to me now because they want to get a lot access to my clients, of course. So what I, in this lightning round, what I want to do is that's my big issue and big problem that I'm seeing with my clients right now. I want to just go down the table, starting actually, Tim, going this way. What is the first we're going to say, what is the biggest problem you see in 10 words or less? And then we're going to go and say, what is the silver lining you see in the next couple of years? So let's start with the bad, and then we'll go to the good. We'll finish off with the good. Microphone, microphone. The good, the good part is that we're California. Um, we're going to dominate the, the, the country, the rest of the world, the Emerald Triangle, where we came from, who we are, heritage and stuff. We're going to do fine long term. Uh, the biggest challenges for me is that, you know, you need compliance law, you know, attorneys, you need compliance people. You need so much that if you don't have a lot of money, uh, you're going to have a hard time being in this industry. And so it's not really a fair playing field. It's really, as you can see, this is a capitalist society and, and you're looking at Constellation, you're looking at, you know, Coca-Cola, you're looking at some major players coming in and it's like, how, how do small farmers and how do small product makers compete with that? Um, I would say... Uh oh your turn. Oh, there you go. Uh, See, the biggest challenge would be the constant pivoting, the re-education, um, just the, 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 the wears and tears of that. 
Um, the silver lining, I would say, is that this is a very uh, agile industry that has been around for a really long time and will continue to be around. And um, we, are, we are very creative and um, able to, uh, you know, we've, we've survived the, the federal interference. We've survived um, lots of trials and tribulations. So this is just another challenge that we're going to have to go through. And I, I think we're going to come out okay. I'd say the biggest obstacle I'm seeing, right, I don't have it personally because we just track all the law, but taxes, hands down it's taxes. I guess silver lining, uh, it's going to keep all the attorneys and consultants in business for a long do time. We have, do, we, no, no, do, we, do we have to throw the tea in the harbor, is that what you're saying? <laughs> no, but, um, <laughs> no, I'd say silver lining is that we're you know, just there. in the first <laughs> inning of a nine-inning baseball game. And so we're going to continue to see problems, but we're going to also be working to fix those for a long time. So never expect the regulations to stay the same. And, you know, that's going to mean a constant re-education, which is truly a pain point. But over the next five years, there's going to be continuous improvements, too. And these kinks are going to get worked out. They're just taking a first shot at it. And you can't expect anyone to get it right on their first try. Uh, so the biggest uh, barrier or challenge to banking access, public safety, and collecting taxes is Congress. Congress. The silver lining is November 6th is coming. We need to flip these seats. My Go out and vote. Now, we, we, if you have questions, we have a microphone set up here for questions. Um, we have about, I think, eight minutes. So if you have a question, please come up to the microphone here to the left, um, and we will do our best to accommodate you. But don't ask complex legal questions because then I'll have to bill you $650 an hour for it, okay? So, hi, this is an awesome panel. My name is Joe Devlin with the City of Sacramento. Um, Apparently you have to eat the microphone. Yeah. It's like an ice cream. <laughs> um, so taxes are definitely too high. Um, how do we facilitate that conversation amongst the local governments? The patchwork doesn't work. I mean, there's some things that can be done. CDTFA can lower the markup rate down to zero tomorrow, right? So that would help, but, um, like, but across the state, we have to have a, a more consistent taxation. So how do we, you know, the League of Cities is, 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 is an entity that exists, but they're not leading that conversation. Is there another avenue of, of facilitating that dialogue, and how do we, how do we shorten that, that implementation uh, difference? This is going to be a really tough one because you mentioned the League of Cities and CSAC as well, but you go into the League of Cities, and I was there as a guest once in their office, and the password to the Wi-Fi, no joke, was local control. And that's kind of the, like, I wish it was a joke, but that's actually their password uh, for the guest Wi-Fi if you need it ever. But um, <laughs> that's kind of the problem with the League of Cities is their thing, that, like, what's interesting is they're not, you know, advocating any policy. They're advocating for local control. So even when the, you see them as anti-delivery, uh, the, the current delivery regulation, they're not anti-delivery, they're anti the cities getting to choose whether or not deliveries go to those cities. And so it's really hard when, when the, you know, ethos has always been let the cities make their own decisions. So therefore it needs to come outside of those organizations and there's gotta be education opportunities where you can bring in the neutral bodies in, in the spaces to actually educate on it. So uh, like we had a county's cannabis conference last summer and that was very effective and I'd love to help you, you know, facilitate this meeting of the minds for the, the cannabis tax conversation for the cities, but we're gonna have to somehow figure out how to pull that group together. But you'd have to redo the whole tax structure. You could start, though, by just, yeah, but you could start by coming up with, like, a, a range of things that are reasonable. Talk about, you know, output-based taxes as opposed to square footage taxes. I mean, there's a lot of things, but we still got to educate them on what those even mean. And so that's step one before you can start looking at restructuring the whole thing. Let's talk about what's working and what's not and what's being done around and, and, we're, and, and, and an honest conversation. What's not working? And so, Joe, Fiona, what, I, yeah. what I was saying is... Um, you know, these taxes are prescribed in Prop uh, um, 64. Yep. Uh, therefore, you either have to go to the ballot with a million dollars of signatures or get two-thirds of the legislature uh, to put it on the ballot. And I think right now the appetite at the state level is people understand that this is a problem. So that's what I would advocate all of you uh, to do is go and educate your state assembly person and your state senator and talk about uh, how these taxes perhaps are too high 
uh, and it's really you know right. hampering this industry. Part yeah, of the problem I, I, is that you is need that to explain why it's actually a problem because it seems counterintuitive that high tax rates are not going to generate more revenue. And I sort of had to bury the city council in data. And you know this happened in Washington State. Their taxes was way too high. They had a compounding effect, and they had to lower it because they couldn't compete with the illicit market. I mean. 10% of zero is zero if everybody's going to the illicit market. So it really comes down to showing them a lot of, and I have a lot of data that I put together, this huge package is showing from all over, and not just with cannabis, but with um, other, other um, products and commodities that you have to have the right economic price point to be able to compete with the illicit market. And I agree with Fiona, uniformity from the state down is gonna be the best way to solve this problem because the patchwork of mosaic is, is not working for people and there's no way to organize everybody in this industry in, in one voice because everybody's dealing with fractured different issues. And so it really is a state level issue at this point in my opinion. Or, and I think you'd need data, Tim. but also you know what localities are successful and what their tax structure is. And if we can have those leaders highlighted, then maybe others would follow instead of you know just like pulling a number out of thin air. And you're right though that it's a patchwork, it's the League of Cities. It should have never been done this way. 64 was a broker deal, and the cities and counties should never have had this input. That's why That's we right. got a nightmare. You know, it's leading to a lot of corruption cases yeah, around, around the state. You know, yeah. and, and you know what she's saying? It's like, I didn't want to get involved politically. I've been an outlaw my whole life. Ten years ago, I got involved on a, on a daily, weekly basis in Mendocino County. And I watched it make a difference in Mendocino and the small cities around there. And those people listen when you go in there. They're the same ten people that go to these supervisors' meetings and these... You know, council meetings. So you have to get involved because they will listen to you, and it will make a difference. I'm told that our time is up. Oh, we can do one more question. One more question. Never mind. Hi. Um, I'm not sure if, if any of you can speak to this, but I think something that's often underrepresented in the in the conversation about pain points is the influence of inaccuracy and inconsistency in testing and how that's being addressed. Oh. Uh, well, I can take that for a second. With the BCC in Humboldt last week, there was a motion to put that in for standardized uh, testing for all the labs, and that was approved by uh, the BCC there. So uh, that was an amazing moment to see because that's been a mess. I, I get asked all the time, where would you invest if you were going to invest in this industry? Um, and I have a policy of not investing with my clients. And I always say, right now, there's a dearth of testing labs and and if you could invest in that. I think there's something like 40 that are licensed, 22 that are active, and 500 that are needed. Yeah, but who gets the testing? The labs that get the highest THC ratings and the cannabinoids and stuff. So right. they're all encouraged so to keep it's raising different, these numbers yeah. up and stuff. And well, it's, a, it's a self-fulfilling circle in that regard, and, right? And one other thing is, this is something you have to be patient with. So back in Colorado, right, this is the first time we're testing cannabis. So they don't even know how best to test it for starters, but they were actually trying to figure out how do we create a proficiency test to make sure that all the labs are coming up with the same test results on the same thing. And I watched them spend 45 minutes talking about, okay, if we have a slab of shatter, how do we take the right piece so that we all have a consistent piece? I mean, 45 minutes, 10 testing labs trying to figure out how they would even take the part out of the slab that they would each have the same piece to know that they were testing it to figure out if they can test similarly. It's gonna take time because this is brand new and we need the scientists and whatnot to get involved and figure out how to even test that everyone is coming up with the same results on the same item. Time. We have another question. Hi, hi uh, j quickly. I, I just got a, a slight shiver down my spine <clears throat> thinking about the track and trace and metric determining the good and bad players, especially after having been up north, going on a whole bunch of farms that are trying to implement with SICPA right now. Um, and then metric, of course, doesn't have a, a, a native uh, distribution component. I guess my question is, uh, what if it goes south? Is there a plan B? Uh, if it goes south in California, um, it could be problematic, and the playing field could be even uh, Do you, do you remember more buying uneven. weed in the 80s? That's plan B. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I don't think government has a plan B. They just expect this to work. So that's what I heard from Richard Parrott, who's the director uh, of the uh, track and trace program at the Department of Food and Ag, that they are ready to go, um, and um, 
Let's cross our fingers and hope it, it works. You know, it's, there's a lot of trial by error in this industry. I have a canned speech, which I'll give a very short part of, which is we are all pioneers in this industry, and we all have to be held to a high standard because we know that there's a high level of scrutiny on what we're doing. But as in any new industry, we're going to learn from our mistakes. We just have to make sure we don't repeat the same mistakes. And I think with track and trade, it's another example where we're going to do some stuff that works, and we're going to find out some stuff that really doesn't work, and it's going to have to be fixed. We are, you know, we are infants in this industry. Um, but I'll tell you this: this is this is the, the kind of phone calls I'm getting now. I'm getting phone calls from New York, uh, Boston, and Canada from. People from pharmaceutical companies, large tobacco companies, large alcohol companies trying to figure out ways to start leveraging this market today so that when that five-year term is up, they can move in very, very quickly. It's very interesting as to the dynamics that I'm seeing behind the scenes uh, from, a, from a legal perspective and how people are gearing up for this at this point. And some people are shaking their head no, some people are shaking their head yes. You know, it's, it's, it's just the nature of anything. Look at Prohibition when it ended. You went from moonshiners to Jim Beam. But not everyone went, became Jim Bean, so it's it's going to have this 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 powerful effect on the industry. And I think at looking at the, at at the future, five years from now, we're going to be in this room, and everyone's going to be dressed more like me, um, and less like um, uh, the Swami that I saw in the back. So um, it's yeah, which is which is kind of sad, um, actually. Um, and uh, I don't think we have any more questions, but I want to thank Tim. Sabrina, Amanda, and Fiona, and you've got to go out and vote, please. Um, we have a real voice for our industry going into the Treasury right now, so please, please vote, and vote, vote for Fiona. Thank you, Richard. Thank you.